This video is made possible by donations to the United States Lighthouse Society from people like you. Speaking this afternoon with Ben Trask, uh, and Ben, I believe, is, uh, are you in Hampton, Virginia, right at the moment? You're at the school where you teach, right? I'm in Newport News, but Newport that's News, right. right next to Hampton, and I you live, live in Hampton. Okay, yeah, and uh, we're going to talk about uh, the lighthouses of southeastern Virginia and uh, the project you're working on, a book on those lighthouses, which is right. of, of great interest to me, and I just want to mention a little personal note here. I don't think I've told you this yet, but I lived in Hampton for a year when I was five years old. I, I was an army brat. Okay. My father was at Fort Monroe. And uh, I, I, for some reason, it's stuck in my mind. I even remember the address of where I lived. I probably shouldn't say it. Uh, not that any, you know, not like people are going to mob the people who live there now or anything. But I remember the address of where I lived. So I just looked at it on Google Earth. The house looks exactly the same as it did uh, right. 60 years ago. Um, but uh, anyway, so I actually remember that pretty well, uh, my, my time in Hampton. It was just a while ago. Yeah. So anyway, um, so you have a long time uh, connection to that area. Uh, I believe you are originally from that area. Is that correct? Right. Uh, my father was in the Navy, so I was born in Charleston and we lived in San Diego. But Hampton was the first place that I had members of. Okay. And we, and we moved in and out of there, but we always seemed to come back to Hampton. Mm hmm. And you have a long interest in the maritime history of that area, correct? Right. Well, uh, I remember my you know, third grade project was uh, uh, monitoring Merrimack, which, of course, that's just it's in our backyard. And so that, that's when it started. And my father was in the Navy. Uh, I served in the Marines. Uh, I worked about 20 some years ago at the Mariners Museum. So I had an interest in the local history, and that sort of sharpened really my interest in maritime history from there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. I just want to mention something else before we get into talking about the, the lighthouses and your, your uh, book project and so forth. Uh, in the classroom where you are now, behind you, uh, above your head, uh, and we're doing this uh, as both a video and audio uh, episode of the podcast, so uh, of course people listening don't want to know what I'm talking about, but anybody watching can see uh, I believe that's origami hanging uh, yeah. above you there. Could you they're, maybe explain uh, a little bit? Origami bats is what they what they are. So, uh, as a teacher, you always come up with your reward system, and my reward system is give you origami butterfly or bat or cricket. Sometimes related to the lesson. Mm. Uh, so, we'll uh, if we're doing something about, uh, I tell a story about the pigeon called Cherami that flew messages during World War One. So sometime mm -hmm. during that particular lesson, I give out origami pigeons and things of that nature of bookmarks. So it's, that's uh, one of my uh, hobbies I picked up when I was living in Okinawa and when I was stationed in, in Japan. Okay. So, yeah. I love them. Yeah. Origami bats. I can make them out really, really well now. That they're, <laughs> they're bats. So they're all like, hanging upside down. They're well, all, of course, of course. Exactly. So that's, that's uh, appropriate. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and uh, remind me uh, where uh, and what do you teach? I teach U.S. history. I teach the second half of U.S. history. So it's, yeah. uh, it's 1865 to the present. And it, mm -hmm. we really do try to make it come up to the present. And when I was in school, uh, the present ended at World War II. Mm hmm but we really do try to bring it up to date. Yeah, I'll just throw in also, uh, I have an older brother, John, who's just who's just retired as a history professor at Randolph College in Lynchburg, Virginia. Okay. Used to be right. Randolph-Macon, they just call it Randolph College now. And uh, he has been working for a long time on, the on a book on the history of the state of Virginia. 
I can't even begin to say how many years he's been working on it, but the 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 uh, the publisher, as I understand it, is still you know uh, still wants to do it. Right. So um, of course the history never ends. So I don't know if his writing of the book will ever end, but hopefully you'll see that in the not too distant future. Okay, look forward to it. Yeah, me me too. So you are working on a book on lighthouses of southeastern Virginia. Does you well? You mentioned your interest in maritime history developed quite a few years ago. Um, have lighthouses also been a, a long interest? It, it wasn't an interest until I started working at the Mariners Museum. So mm -hmm. I wrote my first little article on the Old Point Comfort Lighthouse about 1989, and then uh, I did some more research and my article for the Keeper's Log on that station. And I wrote one on the uh, New Point Comfort, Old Point Comfort uh, lighthouses. So I'd say since about 1990, I've had a serious interest in lighthouses. Mm -hmm. Okay. Can you tell me a bit about the focus of the book you're working on? And part two of that question is when might we expect to see that book? Okay. Well, um, the focus is on the lighthouses of, I say, southeastern Virginia. There's about 11 lighthouses, but there's only five of them still standing. Uh, most of those lighthouses are screw pile lighthouses, and they've been taken down. Mm -hmm. um, and if all goes well, it'll be out next summer. That, that's the date. So but we're starting to submit chunks of stuff to the publisher here pretty soon. Mm -hmm. so. Okay. And that's being published by the History Press, correct? The History Press, right. And yeah. it's... Basically, each uh, history is a chapter, so that's how it's going to be working. But as an overall arching introduction, and because lighthouse keepers moved around and the events moved around, uh, there's some overlapping between the histories of the station. Mm -hmm. The title of the book, and correct me if I'm wrong about this, but I think I read the title of the book is The Lighthouses of Southeastern Virginia, Venerable Attached Friends. Right. Do I have that right? What does that mean exactly? Okay, so there is a nice uh, travel history uh, to the Mediterranean, and it was penned by uh, a Navy chaplain, Walter Colton. He was on the Constellation, and as he's leaving out of the Chesapeake Bay, you know, the last structure he's going to see is the lighthouse there at Cape Henry. And he refers to that lighthouse as, as his venerable friend. So I, ah. I sort of stretched that a little bit and call them venerable friends. But uh, normally when I write a, a book or an article, the, the title comes to me really, really quickly. Um, this was just the opposite. I had to look and look and look. Uh, you know, we had a generic title, a, a descriptive title, but not a good title. And so finally, I latched on that quote and I said, yeah, you think about a service member, Marine or sailor heading out overseas. That's the last structure that they'll see, mm -hmm. you know, as they go out in the harm's way. So I, I uh, gravitated to that and the, and the publisher liked it. Yeah, yeah, I like it. And it makes me think of a couple of things as you're talking about it. One is that to me, the especially the lighthouses of New England are old friends to me. They're vener venerable yeah. friends. Certainly, I've known them for so long. But um, I was just in Ireland for most of the month of July, and there's a lighthouse Fastnet off the south coast of Ireland that's quite famous that we got to see on the tour I was I was with, U.S. Lighthouse Society tour, known as the Teardrop of Ireland. And that was often the last thing right. emigrants leaving Ireland would see right. as they sailed away. So uh, both because it's off the south coast and because uh, of that fact, it's known as the Teardrop. So you're making me think about that. Um, so uh, let's talk about some of the content of uh, the book you're working on. Uh, I, uh, I've known for a long time because I've, I've researched Boston Light and Boston Harbor, the oldest light station in the country. I knew there were slaves there in its very early history right. uh, when it was established in 1716. It's my understanding there was a, a male slave and a female slave with the, uh, the first keeper. And I think there were slaves at some of the other early lighthouses. So I know your area of study is mostly Virginia, but uh, have you found any information about uh, slaves being at uh, lighthouses, either Virginia or anywhere else? The information I have found about slaves and lighthouses uh, for instance, at Cape Henry, slaves are involved in building the lighthouse. So mm -hmm. I think in terms of there's going to be quarrymen that are going to be involved in you know, actually cutting the stone. You have uh, stevedores, you have 
deckhands and things like that they're going to be on the vessels then they're going to put the stone into place i don't have anyone who's specifically a lighthouse keeper that's early but during the lighthouse board when they started to do their inspections this is when they noticed that uh that when they show up there's a, a black keeper or there's acknowledgement that you have somebody that owns that slave but the slave has been there for a long period of time and is involved in the duties of that so you don't see that i would say in a big way into 1850. that being said um, the article i hope to write uh, for the keepers log i call it a glimpse at african-american lighthouse keepers in virginia because it's it's not complete mm -hmm. uh, there's some hints of things like that uh, there is uh, for instance well wolf trap is a light ship uh, the, you have the same uh, lighthouse keeper there for a long time. If you check the slave schedule, he owns about 14, 15 slaves. You think sooner or later, there's going to be some African American that's going to be working on that boat for him. Mm -hmm. uh, and so th that's something you would want to do. Identify all the antebellum white keepers, see if they were slave owners, and then mm -hmm. work backwards and see if you can make a connection. So that's not something I've done. Um, in a big way, but it's something, one of the things that you can do to expand the research on blacks and the, um, working in lighthouses and light ships. Compared to the rest of the country, there were quite a few uh, African-American keepers in the right. Chesapeake region. Uh, why is that exactly? Um, there is uh, probably about 60 black lighthouse keepers that I have identified. Some of them are unofficial, but uh, they certainly did the job. Uh, one of the reasons is that, I guess, when I was taught history earlier, you had Reconstruction ends, you know, about 1877, you know, federal soldiers move out and African Americans lose their rights. And, you know, you have basically Jim Crow after that. That's not quite right. You have a very viable, uh, strong African American political movement, e even in the 1880s and they're still voting and they understand how politics works in the late 1880s. And part of that system is the, you know, the patron system, the spoil systems. If your party's in charge, you're allowed to build out the jobs. So if they're organizing and they're voting, they expect a certain percentage of the positions. And in this area, it didn't matter whether you were you know, working at the customs house or you were you know, the dog catcher or you were the blacksmith, it was a political appointment. So mm -hmm. that, that is something that was there. One scholar has identified about 25% of positions in Eastern Virginia went to African-Americans. So that meant a lot of lighthouse keepers. Mm -hmm. So um, they were very adept through the 1880s in securing what they thought their fair share of the positions were. And one of those positions was, was lighthouse keeper. Mm -hmm. um, some of them uh, will move on, I say, to better positions, like they will come postmasters or things, things of that nature. So um, but that's, that's how you got the job, you, especially for the African-Americans. They had to demonstrate, and you see that in their history before uh, they were uh, lighthouse keepers. They had been staff and COs in the Army. Uh, they were local ministers. They were politically active then you can become a lighthouse keeper. Mm -hmm. And even after you left or in between services as a lighthouse keeper, you were still involved in the politics and you're still, you know, serving, leading from the pulpit and things of that nature. So mm -hmm. if you compare that to uh, some of the um, maritime communities that are white, it, it's a much different approach of how the two different groups become lighthouse keepers. Um, yeah. Okay, that all makes plenty of sense. Uh, so according to what I've read, and correct me if I'm wrong about this, but I believe one of the first Black Keepers who actually got the official appointment uh, at a lighthouse was Willis Augustus Hodges, Cape Henry. Right. Is that, do I have that correct? Uh, can you say a little bit about him? Sure. Uh, what's great about him is that uh, there, he wrote an autobiography. The autobiography was reprinted and edited and it, done a very good job, University of Tennessee Press published it. What's sad for Lighthouse folks like myself is that uh, Hodges does not mention that he was the keeper at Cape Henry, and nor did the editor discover that he was the keeper at Cape Henry. But oh, wow. 
uh, he was born a uh, free black in Princess Anne County. That's now Virginia Beach. He's going to leave Princess Anne County. He's going to live in New York. He has contact with um, John Brown, uh, and he has contact uh, with William Lloyd Garrison. Uh, he's mentioned in the Liberator. When the Civil War is over, he comes back down here. He has family connections, gets very much involved in local government. Uh, he's going to be a representative for the Republican Party because that's where African Americans are going to rely on themselves. So if the Republican Party or later a, a faction of the Re Republican Party that you might call, that are known as the readjusters. And the readjusters, interestingly enough, are the, going to be one of those groups that are going to look to give African American patronage in order to support their, their point of view. And the readjusters are unique to Virginia. So that's another reason that you have a lot of uh, African-American lighthouse keepers. Uh, there's a Senator William Mahone, who is going to go to, con go to Congress, and Congress is very evenly split, Democrat, Republican. He always leans to the Republican, but he uses that in order to get plenty of patronage. So that's another reason that you have a lot of black keepers mm -hmm. of that. But uh, anyway, so Hodges is involved in that early. He gets that early appointment. He does not keep it. Um, noteworthy that he does run actually for the General Assembly. So that's the type of leadership that we're talking for. He mm -hmm. doesn't win, uh, but he gets a fair number of votes. So, um, and he's going to go on to hold other local government positions. Um, but yeah, right around 18... Uh, 1875, 1870s is when people like uh, Hodges start to get, they start to get official appointments. Mm -hmm. Okay, so there are others that followed soon after him? So. Or, or actually in the same, at the same year. There's a uh, okay. Reverend William R. Davis is going to get appointed at uh, Old Point Comfort. Mm -hmm. so, so there are other keepers that get appointed at that time. But mm -hmm. even after Reconstruction is over, you have even a bigger boom in the 1880s with African-American getting appointments. So. Okay. How about black women keepers? Were there some of those as well? Interesting how there's four or five black women lighthouse keepers, and they align themselves almost like women, white women. And by that, I mean you have a situation where you have a, a, a lighthouse keeper at uh, New Point Comfort, he owns slaves. He has three women slaves. They do the 1850 uh, Lighthouse Board inspection, and they mention specifically in here that he has a woman servant that's uh, assisting him. And if you hmm. go to check this the slave schedule, he, own, he owns three women. So if you would assume it's one of those three women that are involved in that. Um, there's a very active lighthouse keeper. In fact, here I'd say he's the most successful John B. Jones at Old Point Comfort. He's going to replace uh, William Davis. And his wife is mentioned in the census as an assistant. Now, I know from looking at lots of other lighthouse keepers, the fact that she's listed in the census as an assistant, that's really rare. Not unheard of, mm -hmm. but rare. But, but evidently, she must have done a lot of the work or the other work that she would be specifically mentioned as a keeper. Yeah. Then in the 1870s, you have a woman named Amy Pettigrew and her husband are gonna be a couple that work at the Craney Island Lighthouse. That almost sets a precedent because there's gonna be at least two, if not three other married couples that are gonna serve at that lighthouse. So it must've been mm -hmm. something about that lighthouse that that fostered that type of arrangement. And finally, you have a woman named Venus Parker that when her husband dies, uh, as often is the case, she's gonna step up and assume the duties. Well, you can't do that un unless you've already been there and know how to run the lighthouse. You, know, you can't, you know, your husband's a bus driver and you've never driven the bus, you can't become the bus driver. Right. So uh, those are the same ways that you would see uh, white women assume duties as lighthouse keeper and you see the same thing with black women yeah although the situation with the slave actually doing the job and getting getting the, she had, the did i did i hear you correctly that apparently one of those three women who was a, a slave of uh the keeper she's mentioned became, in the mm -hmm. she's mentioned in the report that that she was there and, and assisting him in the lighthouse. 
Yeah. Yeah. And did, but did she? She didn't actually get the appointment as keeper, did yeah, she? she did, no, she, she did not. Get but she was. Yeah. But she did basically serve as an assistant at, keeper. At that yeah. same time, and and this would be the Back River Lighthouse. Uh, they did an, the inspection. Uh, keeper Jet, who was not there, his son was there, and they mentioned, you know, that there was a young black man who's there and has been serving at the lighthouse since he was a kid. So again, hmm. somebody that may have been doing that for eight or nine years yeah. um, at the time. But again, sadly, no name mentioned. Yeah. But you go back to look for verification uh, in, in the slave schedule for 1850 and the lighthouse keeper did on slaves. So you, you can you can draw that connection that is one of his male slaves that is that's doing that. So. Yeah. Well, obviously, some of the later keepers are much better documented, but the, again, like I know from trying to find out about the slaves at Boston Light, there's next to nothing right. available on them. Right. So that's got to be frustrating as a, as a researcher. Right. Um, yeah. Um, are there any other personalities among uh, these keepers we're talking about the, that, um, that stand out for you, people we haven't talked about yet? Well, I could tell you more about John B. Jones. He seemed to live in some ways a charmed life. Um, he assumes control of, of the lighthouse there about 1878. And he puts in for uh, a raise in pay because that lighthouse is right next to the uh, Fort Monroe, the army. Uh, Fort is literally surrounding the lighthouse at that time. You also have the beautiful hotels down there at Old Point Comfort, the, the Chamberlain, the Hygieia. So they get that lighthouse gets a lot of guests. And so he's tied up as many lighthouse keepers are providing tours. So he puts in and he wants a bump and pay. The guy that looks at it is a guy named Commander Dewey. Oh. Yeah. So Commander Dewey is later going to be Admiral Dewey. Mm -hmm. Now you know I'm in a school. So. Yeah, I was afraid you're being called to the office. Maybe you did something bad. But. So I'll repeat that. So, mm -hmm. uh, so John B. Jones is one of those individuals that seem to live a, a charmed life. Um, he gets his appointment in 1878. He immediately puts in for a raise because of all the extra duty he has at his lighthouse. The lighthouse is in a heavily traffic area. It's surrounded by Fort Monroe. There's a hotels there, the Chamberlain and Hygieia. So a lot of people are getting tours of the lighthouse. So he puts in and he uh, gets it approved and the officer that's going to approve the promotion is Commander Dewey. Well, that's later gonna be Admiral Dewey uh, yeah. in the Spanish American War. So that's his first contact with fame, so to speak. He also seems to be a, a favorite of, uh, at that time, Commander Ro Rob Lee Evans, who's the district inspector. Uh, and Rob Lee Evans will later become the first admiral of the Great White Fleet that will leave out of Hampton Roads. So he's yeah. kind of rub rubbed elbows with some very famous people. Um, he also uh, stays there for the longest time until his death for about 30 years. So even in his obituary, they mention a couple interesting things that he was able to survive that position through two Democratic presidents, uh, Grover Cleveland. And that, again, really strange that you would actually put that in your obituary that he was able to hang on. So somehow he has some connections or everybody liked him, which I know that's not true, but uh, for him to navigate through all that the politics and then keep right. the job was was very interesting to see that um the other individual again that relates to the book was a guy named charles sterling he's going to earn two silver life-saving medals at, from out there at uh, the craney island lighthouse and it seems like anytime he did something it ended up in the press mm -hmm. the other lighthouse keepers that did the same thing but his stuff always, always got press coverage so even to the point on one of his rescues, uh, it appeared in a syndicated column, you know, this is, you know, American service and it described his life-saving exploits and things like that. So he, he got, he got a lot of press. So did he maybe serve as his own press agent? Do you think? Well, an example would be, uh, he wrote a letter describing what he was trying to do to do his share during world war one. Uh, but, 
you know, as it turns out, his letter shows up in the Lighthouse Service Bulletin. Huh. So, uh, he, like I said, he he must have some connection, but I, I don't know what they are. But anything that he did, he got full attention for it. Interesting. So uh, in looking at uh, some of the, I'm certainly not an expert on the lighthouses or keepers of that area, but I, I know that in addition to the black keepers we're talking about, there were there were other women who were keepers in the, in the region, uh, various uh, immigrants, uh, and uh, there were some married couples and so forth. There was kind of a very diverse group of keepers you had yeah, there. More, more so when you looked at it that way. So you do have uh, married couples, and some of them are from Virginia, and some are not. Mm -hmm. you do have immigrants the immigrants would have gotten here let's say in the 1870s and by the time the early 1900s their english is good enough or they could you know run the lighthouse they they're illiterate things like that so they have the opportunity and you don't think of virginia as being an area that would get a lot of immigrants at, at the you know early 1900s but it but it had their share yeah um and then, you know, they did have women keepers. Uh, most of them were married. Um, most of them were in the 1870s, which is something that's sort of the trend nationally, but some of them uh, worked independently uh, w without a husband and things like that. So more diversity than you would think, really. Yeah, yeah. So in the course of uh, researching, and well, let me ask you, how long have you been working on the, on the book and the, and the article? And the, the uh, well, interest in Lighthouse in it for a long time, uh, but the book, I don't know, about four or five years. Mm -hmm. and, and of course, like many books, that this book is laying the foundation for the next book. So <laughs> we can... We can we can talk about that at, at, at the end, but yeah. Okay. I was going to ask you if there's a, you'd like to make any announcement about what the next book is going well, to be. I, at least I've got, a, I've got an inkling of what I want to do, yeah. You want to save that for sure, we can a put few, it at few the minutes end. so we can get back, get back to that. No. Yeah. Yeah, we'll definitely get back to it. So um, in the course of research on the lighthouses of Southeastern Virginia, anything else that kind of stands out that you found especially surprising, interesting in the course of your research? Well, the number of uh, black keepers was a really surprise because the first article that I wrote about the Old Point Comfort Lighthouse, that's where John B. Jones was. And I mm -hmm. didn't uncover or learn that there was a black lighthouse keeper there. So it wasn't until I sort of got my third stab at it that I realized that there were, you know, Af African-American lighthouse keepers and I was finding other, other lighthouse keepers. And then it turned out there was two or three other people or organizations that were learning the same thing basically at the same time. So mm -hmm. um, that was one thing. The other thing that was interesting to me is that, you know, I had an impression you have, you had a lighthouse keeper, he has an assignment and he's at that station all the time. That's not true, at least down here. If they would have, you would have a career lighthouse keeper who might spend, you know, 25, 30 years in service but he would serve at five or six years at different lighthouses and he yeah. would move, move around. Sure. So that was new to me. The other thing that I noticed, it wasn't a uh, matter of race. It was a matter of culture. There's two uh, areas that just seem to, you know, foster the lighthouse keepers. One is the outer banks so that you have keepers that are from the outer banks that are serving up in Virginia regularly. Mm -hmm. And the other uh, county is Matthews County. So Matthews County, as I looked at, probably had, believe it or not, 100 lighthouse keepers that served at 50 different lighthouses from Maryland down into North Carolina. Lighthouses, yeah. lightships, uh, captains on tenders. So very much a maritime community. Mm -hmm. uh, and so that, that is going to hopefully be the, the next book to, to describe, you know, the culture that would generate 100 lighthouse keepers and and i you compare that to nearby counties like york county gloucester county middlesex county there, there's no comparison they're they're not generating same population but they're not generating the same number of lighthouse keepers so mm -hmm. those are the things that were the surprise to me okay interesting i'll just mention you you've touched on the subject of uh, screw pile lighthouses you had a lot of those uh, cottage style screw pile lighthouses right. both in chesapeake bay and North Carolina, the right. sounds in North Carolina, they're pretty much all gone now. Thomas Point Shoal being the only one in Chesapeake Bay that's still in its original position. Right. 
uh, on the bay, so a couple of others that are at museums and so forth. But um, in, the, in uh, this research and in the book you're working on, you, you must uh, be uh, learning a lot about life at, at those lighthouses, which was pretty unique. Um, yes. And um, it, it, for some people, you could see where they really loved it. There was a keeper at one of the lighthouses that the get interviewed by a newspaper reporter and talked about, you know, don't you miss not having a family and don't you miss this? And he said, well, uh, you know, I'm basically on here for 22 days, but in eight days, I got a house in the city. So, so you would have, have that opportunity to, to go off to work, but uh, you know that the family was, wasn't that far away. Right. The other thing I've learned, and it, was, it took slow, that evidently was the best fishing in the world. We, <laughs> you've got that lighthouse about five feet, you know, five feet on the water, and yeah. you, and of course, it literally serves. We put the rocks around it and stuff like that. So, um, they had great fishing. And not only that, they had a time where you have a place like called White Shoals. Well, White Shoal is called White Shoal because of oyster shells. Mm -hmm. So you have all the oysters you want to eat and things like that. So that that, that was you know that was pretty good living until the hurricanes came and there was nothing between you and that hurricane. Yeah. And then then was a different story of the ice flow. So, mm -hmm. uh, but you think about sitting out that, you know, get, taking in that sunset every night, things like that. Not, not, not a bad way to make a living. Yeah. Right. But as you said, there were dangers involved. And I know right. the ice was a scourge of a lot of those uh, lighthouses. Yeah. Any stories along those lines that, that come to mind, uh, either ice or storms at those places? Um, one of the things that's interesting, and, and I've never seen this before, but they knew the storms would be some, so bad sometimes on the James River, like with uh, Deepwater Shoal, they would give the lighthouse keeper permission to when he needed to, you know, to sort of come ashore to let, let them do that. Mm -hmm. Or I've heard them, uh, keepers talking about, you know, the lighthouse was like you were sitting in that screw pot lighthouse during the storm. And it was like, you were, you just sat still and, but you were on a rocking chair. That mm -hmm. thing was going, going back and forth and, you know, no one was going to come get you or anything like that. Yeah. So yeah, they could be pretty harrowing. They had, of course, tanks for gas and things like that. And those lighthouses. And when those tanks broke loose, one of the lighthouse keepers described how it, they just pinballed around in there and just destroyed everything in the lighthouse. So wow. uh, pr pretty harrowing, but, you know, also, you know, pretty great. And that's where a lot of your stories come in where, because, those people are very skilled. They can launch the boats. They do a lot of you know, mm -hmm. life-saving or rescuing and helping people too. Yeah. So I imagine those uh, typically it was a lot like some of the, the offshore uh, wave swept or, you know, rock lighthouses as they might be called in new England and right. other places where they would assign typically three, maybe four keepers total right. crew, but have probably usually two at the place at, at one time and they would kind of rotate and have sh shore leave for for a while like you said right so, yeah yeah and you have like i said about 22 days on eight days off and mm -hmm. you know, normally you would be there with somebody else uh but you would have sometimes we'd be be there alone but yeah, yeah. the rotation were some of those screw pile lights uh family stations or are they pretty much them? some of them like i said craney island I know it had couples, but I never found any indication that children lived mm -hmm. in those lighthouses. And some of those people had a lot of children. So I'm not sure what that arrangement was, where who took care of the kids or the older kids taking care of the younger kids when mom and dad were at the lighthouse. I have not been able to work that out. But in yeah. Green Island was a situation where you, know, you had couples assigned to that, that lighthouse. Mm -hmm. But I've never known of any situation where uh, the family lived in the screw pile lighthouse right yeah i, I don't remember offhand uh, reading about children living in, in those types of lighthouses yeah. but if somebody you know we have a lot of lighthouse buffs yeah, listening if somebody knows of something maybe they can let us know yeah because it, it, you you can look at the census you can see that you know husband and wife are the lighthouse keepers and you can see they got seven or eight children mm -hmm. who, you know who's who's watching the kids yeah, yeah, maybe I know like at Boston Light being a small island out in Boston Harbor during the school year, the kids would board with families on the mainland so they right. could go to school. Yeah. They would actually live at the lighthouse in the summer, but I don't know if there was anything like that. Um, so let me ask you, uh, I, I think it's great that you're uh, writing the book on the subject and you're including a lot about uh, the black keepers and so forth. 
Um, that's that's a really, really good thing. I applaud you for that. So you're going to bring a lot of attention to that subject. Is there anything else going on that you're aware of that's uh, designed to recognize the, the Black keepers of the past? Well, I, I'm not the only one that's involved in this. The U.S. Lighthouse Society has been in touch with me and wants me to share what I have. And I've seen that they've got uh, black keepers that are listed. There's also the local chapter, the Chesapeake chapter. Uh, yep. We'll see what they have there and stuff like that. So I think you know between the three of us, if we pool our stuff together, and which uh, you know which I hope to do, yeah, and po post my findings, you know, we'd all be able to share. So like I said, I, I'm not um, and the only one that's been able to do this. There was a also a researcher, and I'm not going to pronounce her name right, but her name is Sandra Clunes. Oh, so uh, Clooney's. I know her. Clooney, yeah. Yes, yes, she is. Uh, I've started finding black lighthouse keepers, and then a librarian handed me her research, and I said, "Oh gosh, this is great." And then I started to say, "Okay, you can see the pattern of all these individuals getting appointed in the early 1880s. There's got to be a reason for that." So that's mm -hmm. when I started to research the readjusters and, um, you know black political power in the 1880s and stuff like that, that that made sense to me that why they would be getting those appointments so yeah yeah you mentioned the chesapeake chapter of the u.s lighthouse society i believe uh, jennifer jones i think is their historian she's been doing research on this subject right. for for some time as well so yeah that's great uh, the more people researching it the better um so uh let me ask you a a, a real big blanket question here why preserve any of this history? Why is this stuff important? Well, it's interesting that the term you use, because I do talks on this too. It, it is history. It's history, whether, you know, you know about it, I know about it, uh, whether you, you write it down, it happened. Mm -hmm. What I think makes the difference is that you, you're going to take history and you're going to make it into heritage. Mm. You're going to make people aware of it. So I'll give you another local example that everybody knows about. The, the book Hidden Figures deals with African-American women mathematicians that were did computations before computers at NASA yep. in Hampton. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah. So that is a Hampton story. Right. A national story, but it's a Hampton story. I grew up in this area, astronauts, demigods, you know, if your dad worked at NASA, he met this astronaut, your mom did this at NASA, all that stuff about the astronauts was, was great, great. You've got all sorts of local bridges named after here, you've got local uh, library named after astronauts and things like that. Mm -hmm. That history of black women doing those competitions, that, that didn't go away, that really was there. It's not until you write a book called Hidden Figures and you have a children's version of the book and you have a great movie version of the book and you, you dedicate a school to you know Katherine Johnson stuff like now you start to have a heritage right that people can talk about so one of my summer jobs was doing a boat tour when I can point to the Virginia Air and Space Museum and say okay and then you mention hidden figures and you see everybody's face go oh yeah that means we now have a common heritage Mm -hmm. We get it. I don't have to elaborate so much on that. They all make a connection between where they are and that that national story and that interesting story. So you want to do the same thing with Black Lighthouse Keepers because yep. you don't know how many faces you see light up when I'm saying I'm doing a, a podcast and it relates to Black Lighthouse Keepers because I, I said, oh, really? I said, well, that's why you're doing it because everybody says, oh, really? Mm -hmm. um, so that's what you want to do. You want to change history into heritage. You want people to be aware of it. You want to be able to point to different things in the community. I have a similar instance um, in Hampton. We have a school that was named after Jefferson Davis. Jefferson Davis was imprisoned at Fort Monroe for two years. Mm -hmm. uh, the idea was he was going to be brought to trial, either involved in the plot to assassinate Lincoln, or he was in, you know, could certainly be charged with treason. That that did not happen, but that's where he was held. Hampton in the 1960s and naming their school, they would name them after an individual who was local and noteworthy or a national figure that had some connection. Well, they named their school after Jefferson Davis, was a national yeah. figure, had a connection. They changed the name of the school, understandably. They changed it to an individual who was a Black pilot, who was Cesar Tarrant, and that was Tarrant Middle School. Okay. But people don't realize 
he's sort of the tip of the iceberg that there mm -hmm. were at one time in the colonial era in the early 1800s, many, many black pilots. And so you would come into the Chesapeake Bay and the first person on your deck of your boat would be somebody who would be, you know, of African descent saying, okay, you're going to pay me to take over your boat and to bring it into Norfolk or Portsmouth or Hampton. Mm -hmm. So um, that is so much part of local maritime history that the British are aware of it and they look for black pilots in the War of 1812 and the American Revolution because they want their, their skill set. So later after the War of 1812, you outlaw African Americans from becoming black pilots. That means you have a history, but you don't have a knowledge of it, so you have no heritage. So mm -hmm. you, you're changing the name of that school if you build upon that. Then you can describe, you know, the broader heritage that was that was there, but it's not there now. The same thing with black lighthouse keepers. Of course, the reason there's no black black house keepers, there's no more really white lighthouse keepers anymore either. But that's what you're trying to do: trying to change history into heritage, make people aware of it. Yeah, no, oh, no. beautifully said. Uh, a few minutes ago, you mentioned uh, that you were uh, involved with uh, boat tours, right? You uh, right. did that for some time. Yes. And uh, did I understand you right? We were chatting a little bit before we started the interview. Is it possible you might be getting back into the tour business a little bit? Yes, there's a the boat was sold. Uh, the owners had had the business for a long time and, and you know, they were, they were ready to move on and really, really retire. Mm -hmm. uh, so they sold the boat to a concern in Delaware. And there's a, another boat that's in the process of moving in. I've got a couple of friends that worked on the old boat that are getting ready to work on the new boat. What I would like to do them with them is specialized tours. So we talked about some doing something like, you know, the Civil War in Hampton Roads or, you know, Hampton Roads, African-American perspective. Uh, you could do Hampton Roads in World War II. And one I hope to do like in October would be Haunted Hampton Roads. So there's a, a lot you can do, do with that. And uh, we'll see if we can't work that out. So I'll, st I'll get back on the boat. That, that would be my third boat. I did a tour one year uh, called the Yorktown Lady and that was on the York River. So I was a narrator on that too. Okay. Well, put me down for your tours when you start up again. I'll take okay. a, a visit down there, and uh, which I've been meaning to do more often. I'm overdue in visiting my brother and seeing uh, that that region in general. So um, I just got a, a couple more questions for you. Uh, first of all, you hinted earlier you might uh, tell us what uh, your next. Well, you did say a little bit about what your next book is going to yeah, be. Yeah, um, like I said, I did. Uh, Research for Newport News Middle Ground Lighthouse, which mm -hmm. is, uh, it's right off uh, Newport News Point. It's not far from Coal Piers and the Newport News Shipyard where all our aircraft carriers are built. And it's put there in, in 1891. And it's very easy on these websites to see, uh, you know, who all the keepers are. Mm -hmm. But it takes somebody that's from Matthews to recognize that's a Matthews name. That's a Matthews name. You can pinpoint where those people, literally what county they are from potentially by their names. And so mm -hmm. I started to look at those names. I started to run them through ancestry.com. And you look at like the first four head lighthouse keepers are from Matthews. And they've got about six or seven lighthouse keepers from Matthews. And I said, right. that's, that's got to be a thing. You know, that, that's not a that's not a fluke. Right. Yeah. And then you also the other side of that, there are about eight or nine of them are from the Outer Banks. So now you're starting to look at why why do those cultures generate uh, so many lighthouse keepers? Yeah. It's a very good book called Matthew's Men, and it describes about the life of six brothers that are merchant mariners and that are, you know, involved with liberty ships and tankers and oilers and, you know, getting sunk, you know, trying to feed the Russians and feed the, the British during World War II. And that tells the story about, you know, why does this community generate so many um, uh, lighthouse keepers? Interesting connection to New England. I had an uncle, uh, again, my mother's family is from Matthews. And so he's, you know, very much, as I said, you know, works on the water, follows the water. Mm -hmm. He ends up in Gloucester, Massachusetts. Uh -huh. And, and that's where he's buried. Mm -hmm. But, you know, he's he's he went from one maritime community to another, same sort of thing. So same skill set. Sure. So that's what drew me to that. And plus, there's some fascinating family connections where you have 
three brothers that are lighthouse keepers, a sister who marries a lighthouse keeper, and then the sister's niece is also married to a, a skipper on a light ship. And then the niece has a son who's in the Coast Guard. He ends up being on the lighthouse. So there's some fantastic family connections, very, very intricate. To yeah. Try to tease that out. It's not just mom and pop. It's uncle, brother, cousin, you know, things of that nature that they're all they're all related and they're all involved in the lighthouse service in some way or another. So, yeah, well, that's fantastic. So I have one final question for you. OK, and this is for bonus points. All right. So okay. get your thinking cap on. Um, what has been your favorite thing about researching and writing about the history of lighthouses and keepers in southeastern Virginia? I liked to take my knowledge of local history and apply it to how it would have been through the eyes of a lighthouse keeper. Mm -hmm. So you've got, uh, for instance, World War II is going on. How are lighthouse keepers involved in that? You even have something like the, in the 1880s, Charleston had an earthquake. Well, the earthquake is felt all the way up here, uh, different branch of the government writes all the lighthouse keepers and says, give us a report on what you experienced during the earthquake. So they would be filling out reports like that. I mentioned, you know, um, Thimble Shoals is the location where the ships are going to cruise in and out of the Great White Fleet. A uh, little more embarrassing for the Navy in the early 1850s, that's Thimble Shoals is also where the USS Missouri will run aground and be out there for two weeks. And the, and the best photograph platform is the lighthouse. So it's interesting to see local history through, through the eyes of lighthouse keepers. Even something as odd as a yellow fever epidemic, which occurs in Hampton in 1899, uh, everybody quarantines a town and the lighthouse keeper isn't sure where he's supposed to go, who's going to come out and feed him or anything like that. So wow. never, never thought about those local events through the, through the eyes of the lighthouse keepers. So, uh, and then the fact that, like I said, so many of the lighthouse keepers, you know, they moved around. It was very much, you know, part of their culture. So I learned a lot yeah, just by doing that, even though I knew those events, I never thought in terms of them through the eyes of a lighthouse keeper. Yeah. Well, that makes, makes plenty of sense. And we always, a lot of us like to say that lighthouses provide a window to all such broad history in our, right. our yeah. country and the, the world. Yeah. yeah. So that makes uh, perfect sense to me. So uh, Ben Trask, it's a, it's a real pleasure talking with you. And I, I feel like we need to do this again sometime. Sure. Uh, certainly when your book comes out, if not sooner, but um, uh, there's so, so much uh, connected to this that we could talk about, but I want to remind our listeners to watch for your article in an upcoming issue of the Keeper's Log, the U.S. Lighthouse Society's right. quarterly journal. Do we know yet when that's going to appear or not yet? No. <laughs> okay. But it will be, it uh, will be. within probably the next few issues somewhere in there. Um, and to watch for your book uh, coming sometime next year from the History Press, The Lighthouses of Southeastern Virginia venerable attached friends. Uh, so uh, I want to thank you on behalf of uh, Lighthouse and History Buffs everywhere for doing what you're doing and uh, keep up the good work. And are you going to be retiring from teaching fairly soon? Two years and then I go to semi-retirement. Yeah. Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah. I was going to wish you good luck in your retirement. Maybe I was a little premature saying that, but yeah. anyway, uh, continued success. And uh, thank you so much for joining me today. Really appreciate it. Thank you, Jeremy. Enjoyed it. <laughs>